Hey guys, Steven here, 40 plus BJJ. I wanted to uh, respond to a comment. I haven't done a video here in the group for a while, but I thought this was timely because what you see if you've been doing this for a long time like I have and had this community, 40 plus BJJ community, the, the email subscriber list, it's been about 11 years now I've been doing this, um, minus all my experience prior to that, uh, prior to starting this online program. I see a lot of patterns, right? Like literally in the thousands. And so periodically I like to sort of check in when I see the same types of conversations recycling over and over again because it's common to everybody's experience. And specifically we had a thread um, just, just recently. And uh, let's see, let me look at the actual post. So the post was uh, one of our group members here saying what's worse getting your butt kicked on the mat because the other guy is better or because you're often rolling injured and can't give it 100%. So this gets into a conversation, right, that comes up all the time in one way, shape or form, which is the frustration over being set back, maybe feeling behind, um, feeling like you're constantly battling against this, you know, overwhelming current of fatigue and soreness and injuries being racked up and just constantly feeling like you know you're you're like a, battling the tide right that you're never going to be able to uh, to win that game but it also gets to this whole uh, semantics about training hard and you know working through discomfort and how much intensity is appropriate before it gives diminishing returns also very common and all these things we can use the exact same terminology, phrasing, words, but mean vastly different things. And it's very important to understand that one, one thing may be very appropriate in one context and it cannot serve you whatsoever. It can actually be detrimental in another context, right? So for instance, I did the video, which is still, I believe, pinned in the announcements here about um, strength, right? And some people still tried to argue while either cherry picking the information or not using it. But the whole thing was me really observing over years, people continuing to recycle, right? No judgment, no insult to anybody. Uh, you know, we all do this as part of learning, right? But recycling the same logical fallacies about the use of strength and training. And a lot of times what they're saying about it are things that they've heard even from authorities. And in some cases, they're either just flawed logic, regardless of who's saying it, right? Because it's not about my opinion versus somebody else's opinion and you know whose who's shit is bigger, right? It's, it's simply about, is it actually true from first principles? Like, does it logically sound or not? But a lot of times they may be saying something, and this is the danger, where what they're saying is correct, but it's not correct in the context that they've intended it, right? So they're not getting that nuance. So it's an important conversation. We start talking about, you know, um, I can't give it 100%. What does that mean in context? What are we actually doing when we show up to the practice room or to class to train? And what's our objective and how much is, how much is ideal, is optimal, and how much starts to put us into another realm where we're going to almost facilitate the frustration that we're feeling because we're creating unrealistic expectations with our training, okay? So I thought instead of going to the mat where we have all this emotional investment and what we show up to do every day that we're passionate about, maybe we have all these frustrations building up, I actually wanna step off the mat and go to the board to talk about this. But uh, before I do that, I just read you the post, but um, we had one of our members, been a member for a long time, um, named John. John's actually, you know, traveled to see me and do some privates from a couple states away um, a few years ago, which is really nice to meet him. Uh, very nice guy. And um, he was asking about, he's talking about his knees and needing cortisone shots. Quick aside, some of you are aware that I had a, um, a series of two PRP injections, platelet-rich plasma, in my shoulder after basically Lots of years of wear and tear, multiple subluxations. Um, I had bone spurs, some osteoarthritis formed and um, a partial labral tear. And I was a candidate for surgery uh, or basically said you could try cortisone. 
So I said, no, luckily my surgeon's very progressive in that. And he said, I totally agree. The reason why some people do it is because it's covered by insurance, but it is a band-aid, right? It'll make you feel great short term, uh, kills the inflammation, kills the pain. However, you're basically masking the symptoms and the cortisone uh, will degrade and uh, facilitate the deterioration of soft tissue in a joint over time. And a lot of times um, you don't always hear this from the, uh, from the um, uh, orthopedics. And I think it's important to point that out for athletes because you don't want to just inherit uh, more issues down the road. You know, if I'm a football player with a limited shelf life to make my millions or something, uh, you know, pro football, and you got to shoot me up with cortisone, cortisone to just get me out to be able to finish the season, that's a totally different animal. Um, when you're looking for long-term success, long-term growth within this thing that you love to do, and you're looking for longevity, I don't recommend the cortisone shots. I did pay out of pocket for PRP, but it has a similar success rate, which is like 85% or something for, you know, for shoulders, for knees and everything. Uh, similar success rate is stem cells, but about a 10th of the cost. So I was really, really happy. I mean, I went from not being able to roll with any degree of intensity to be in most of the positions. I had to completely kind of change how I moved during drilling and rolling. And uh, it, it dramatically reduced my training time. But, um, you know, just to do this was going to be extremely painful for me prior to getting the PRP. And then after eight weeks, you know, do I feel this? Does it feel like when I was a kid, when you, you know, when you don't feel anything, when you do this, I feel it, but it's a small percentage and I'm able to train pretty much unrestricted right now with it. So uh, highly recommended. All right, back to the case at hand. So in response to this thread about um, either getting beaten up or feeling like you can't go 100% because of your injuries. Uh, John was talking about his knees, a uh, source of frustration, holding him back, and I mentioned the PRP, and he said, funny, uh, Stephen, I was going to text you. Want to know, after so many years of training, how do you not get injured? Five years in, I literally feel beat up. I'm 55 and go hard with these 20-year-olds. Takes me a week to recover from a two-hour rolling session. I've tried everything from joint supplements to cortisone, etc. I will give a PRP or I will give PRP a shot. Kind of depressing because I want to train four more times per week. Advise, please. So, my guess is this is either something that rings very true with a lot of you, and if it doesn't, it will soon. By the way, I'm 49, just so people know. Um, you know, some people in the group are are older. Uh, however, I will say this. Um, so when John says, how do you not get injured? Well, I've had a lot of injuries and, and um, honestly, probably more than a lot of people in this group, you'd be surprised, right? <laughs> I've had a lot. And a lot of that I attribute to my approach when I was younger, um, when I was first starting jujitsu versus, uh, which was what, 90, 99. So yeah, I mean, 22 years of jujitsu approximately now. But I was, um, I was going, you know, again, hard and resisting things and not always training um, the most optimal way, putting myself in positions where, uh, you know, later on my body kind of regrets it. And uh, so things that I could do, it's um, like, uh, what's it, Jeff Goldblum's character in Jurassic Park where he's saying, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> so there were things I could physically do, but I paid for it later on and uh, had to you know, change my approach. The good news is most of my issues that I have now are issues that I am still working around the consequences of treating it like the Wild West back then. And I really don't have many kind of new issues cropping up now. Um, and that is a direct re result of the approach that I have in my training now versus what I used to uh, back then. And a lot of that is not just me personally. It's something that everybody can emulate because it really is a uh, is something that you can kind of approach like systematically, even systemically. You know, if you're in any sort of decision making process with the program that you train in or the school. But let's let me just pull back the curtain again. So um, we want to go up to like the 30,000, 50,000 foot view and just look at what it is that we're doing when we show up to class or on the practice mat. 
and take all the garbage in our head out of it, right? Because we, we do accumulate so much shit in our head that often is what leads to people ultimately becoming so self-judgmental and so frustrated that they'll post-rationalize the reason, but on an unconscious level, these are the things that will drive us ultimately to stop doing jujitsu and say, you know, things like, I lost my passion for it or whatever, or, you know, it just wasn't for me anymore and any of the number of ways to articulate that. But really something took place unconsciously where we felt that we could no longer in some way like live up to the image that we had of what we wanted to be in our relationship to jujitsu somehow falling short, somehow having your status lowered in some way, right? And we really just need to get back to what it is, again, that we're doing when we show up to practice. Take 100% of your feelings about you stacking up to your training partners, you in your eyes of your instructors or senior students, you in relationship to how uh, good you thought you would be or at what point, what belt level, what level of achievement you thought you would have up to this point. Belts, everything. Let's take all that out. Just look at what it is that we're doing. So, uh, jiu-jitsu is a system. And systems theory, right, and this is, should be com um, somewhat common for everybody in terms of, or look familiar, in terms of this sort of the rudiments of the scientific method, okay? So what do we have? We have inputs in a system. Then here we have a process. In this case, that process is practicing for skill development. And once you go through that process, right, then you're going to have outputs. So in a scientific method, right, what is this? What are the inputs, right? Well, you have come up with some sort of hypothesis. In this case, this is probably things that, in some cases you're testing, um, that you may even be like trying to figure out on your own that nobody taught you. In a lot of cases, this is you putting into the system what it is that you have learned through the various sources, in class, through instructional series, like 40 plus B to J instructional series, things like that. Um, and then you go and you're trying them out. And once you put them into the process of training, which has different modalities, Hopefully, right? It shouldn't just be the only training you do is to go in and go 100% like, hey guys, you know, <laughs> no practice. I'm just going to come in and roll 100%. That sometimes is a plague for upper belts um, who to some extent uh, can create a kind of a confirmation bias for others because they're really athletic at a certain level of their development. They can get away with that. Even if you can just only show up to open mats or comp team practice or something, and only ever just roll as hard as possible and it seems like you're still getting better at a high rate and other people are like, oh fuck, he doesn't even come to class and he gets better, like, you know, just by showing up and rolling. Um, doesn't mean it's ideal because yeah, you're super athletic, super coordinated, great like mind-body connection in terms of learning and everything. You could still be better if you didn't approach training that way, right? So it can be a little skewed, but anyway, I digress. So we've got our, our inputs, we've got our process, which is the actual skill development going on in class. Then we have our outputs, right? Outputs are your results, right? So how did it go? You know, again, not, not emotionally speaking, just in terms of, in jujitsu, we're constantly faced with problems, right? And this is important because whenever we're talking about a system, right? The system is always taking place, let me kind of block this off, in an environment. And the environment is always variable in a nonlinear system, which jujitsu is. By the way, anything that is actually aligned to reality is nonlinear. That's why um, if we go back to like UFC 1, where the world outside of a tiny pocket of Brazil and you know just a few people in the Gracie Garage in California first really got exposed to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu right with Hoist Gracie and all of a sudden it created kind of a, a schema violation within martial arts like the entire martial arts world because everybody assumed 
that the skinny Brazilian guy that does the whatever stuff they do, the Mexican ground karate, right? He was just gonna get rolled over by these guys who were these gnarly strikers, no weight classes, everything. And when you saw them doing their little demos of their technique, it's like, it almost just looked kind of soft what Hoist was doing when he's back there with his brother, like kind of, oh, let me pull guard and elevate and like have you land an armbar. These guys are like doing these nasty, tearing each other up. Striking sequences and like, oh shit that skinny guy's gonna get killed. And then what happens, he goes, goes in, he beats everybody quite easily, he doesn't even really hurt anybody, just everything's you know, basically finning with, finishing with chokes and arm bars. And all of a sudden, uh, people got a really clear look at the difference between not only a system that was optimized for greater outputs, but also um, when it came to people coming in with more classical backgrounds, like, Jiu-Jitsu was able to exploit some of the weaknesses in, say, the ability to keep somebody from closing the distance, to, to hurt them in that one interval to close the distance and then prevent the takedown. And then, of course, helpless on the ground because they had no ground fighting. So Jiu-Jitsu was optimized to be able to, like, they were used to closing in on strikers. Strikers weren't used to dealing with somebody closing that distance in an instant. You realize all of a sudden you can't blow their kneecap out with one shot and you know, rake their eyes on the way in, and then, you know, I've got no takedown defense, I've got no ground game, so of course once we hit the ground, we're screwed. But um, the other thing, meaningfully there, is that the classical approaches to training reveal themselves to be abstractions, okay? So if you're doing one-step sparring drills, if you're doing forms, kata, things like that, you know, we already know that's not, that's a linear system, and people are trying to basically um, create training methods that are abstractions of reality. Anytime we have an environment, the environment is always going, if, if it's real, right? It's always going to be nonlinear and it's always going to be variable, right? So what's the perfect example of that? The weather. So we can try and predict the weather, but we can't control the weather, right? There will be hurricanes, there will be tsunamis, there will be uh, tornadoes and things like that that'll happen. And it's not really something that we uh, are able to control, right? So the weather can change. You can plan your wedding day for the perfect day. Uh, five days out, it looks like it's gonna be beautiful, clear, sunny, sun, sunny skies, and then all of a sudden, torrential downpour the day of the wedding. That is non, that's nonlinear reality, right? And we know this to be true in jujitsu, where it's very nonlinear, it's dynamic, it's changing moment to moment. There's a lot of variables there that can come into play. So that's very important to understand in the context of that. But the good thing is, you know, if you learn a new form, like I did in my first discipline, right, when I was doing karate and I knew a bunch of forms and sort of you get the gold star and you advance, um, that's great, but it does not have any necessary, any necessary correlation to skill in a live environment. Jiu-Jitsu, we know it does because we're actually training live in one way, shape, or form, whether it's through live drilling, you know, situational, positional drilling, what we call isolation, uh, or actually rolling or wrestling, right? So we know that. So back to the system, inputs, process, outputs. Now, you, so you have your hypothesis here. You've got your results here, okay? And essentially then what happens is this. And what is this? This is analysis or evaluation, and this is feedback, right? And what, what do we do with feedback, right? We iterate along the way, so we're solving problems, right? We want to cr come up with a solution within a dynamic variable environment. So we start off with the hypothesis, hypothesis that's what you've been learning, or what you're trying to problem solve with your training partners to figure out. Then we go to the process, right, which is facilitated usually in a class environment, or it's you getting together with a training partner outside of regular class in an open at, or meeting up one-on-one -on -one or something like that, and working out these things, putting them through the, uh, through the cycle of um, skill development, and then you have your results. And usually that's, okay, well, how did I do? Like, how did that, how did that training session go? How did that role go with that particular person? And again, we're trying to be as the least emotional 
about this in terms of comparison and all the interpersonal dynamics and everything like that. When I say comparison, I don't just mean you to your training partners, but also to your own image of where you think you should be at, right? Being a little more objective. Then once we have those results, we just try and look at them objectively, right? And then we're gonna evaluate sort of, okay, what went well, what didn't, right? And then this is helpful too, just to start to divorce yourself a little bit from, I was just shit on the mat, everything sucked, to, well, did I do anything, right? You know, like sometimes you'll feel emotionally like you did nothing right, but that's really rarely true, right? You start to say, even if this training partner completely dominated me, right? Was I at least, even if I was late on everything, was I at least knowing what I should do, even if I was coming to that conclusion too late? It already means that you're learning something, right? So we'd be now, uh, going through the evaluation analysis process, process, and then we iterate based on that so that we can go back and try to put some new hypotheses in. So in other words, what's a new hypothesis? Well, um, I was very late on this, or I skipped a step on this that I remembered after the fact. Shit, right? But it is what it is, so now I'm going to try and go back and put that back into the system and see if I get a better result. That doesn't mean 100% success, like all of a sudden now I can, I'm a blue belt and now I'm tapping out, um, technically, not because I'm a mon physical monster, but now I'm technically tapping out all the black belts. That's unrealistic, right? But was I able to do better than before, right? Am I seeing incremental increases? And essentially what we're doing in jujitsu and all we're really doing when we show up to practice is to try and create a positive feedback loop, right? I mean, there's other things too. There's how it affects you as a person, right? Uh, personal development aspects of it and social as aspects of really liking the people that you're surrounding yourself with that become your friends and all that stuff. But in terms of training, it's skill development is our objective and we always wanna be creating a positive feedback loop. When you get too much in here, you create what? Negative feedback loop. Right, so that's, that's the danger. So that's really the most important thing. This gets back to the whole purpose of what we're doing. And then with that in mind, okay, let's focus here a little bit more. So what is that process? Well, I've got a few tips for you in terms of trying to either prevent or train around injuries um, or, or, or be training while you're giving yourself a little bit of time to heal, right? Obviously, something's, you know, hurting you or whatever. You need to sometimes just take a step back and just say, all right, maybe I can't train for a little bit. I'm really going to let this heal up in earnest. Not just till the nerve endings at the site of something that hurts uh, start to feel better, but like till it's truly healed and then I start to work myself back in. Or if I'm going to work around a true injury, not just a soreness or something like that, um, am I doing it for real or am I immediately just getting caught up in the moment and making bad decisions when I'm training, right? Because I'm going too high a degree of intensity, being reckless, then you pay the price over and over again. You really have to look at those things and just strip your ego out of it and just do what is going to be best for you. Never looting, losing sight of the point that we're here to train long term. My number one goal for you isn't to get a black belt, even though I want everybody here to get a black belt, because if you, if you continue to train, you can, um, and, and do it intelligently. But ultimately, my main goal is just for you to continue to be able to do jujitsu. So that being said, in terms of process, right, and using systems, one is there is a, uh, there is an inverse relationship between intensity and volume. Very important to understand right? That's not negotiable. It is true, right? So you cannot have a high degree, max degree of intensity with a max degree of volume. So when we start talking about in this process, okay, I go hard, right? I go hard with these 20, 20 year olds, 25 year olds. I'm 55, okay? As the case may be, or, or insert, you know, I'm 62, whatever the age. What does that mean? Does that mean dedicated? Does that mean focused? Or does that mean I'm essentially doing an anaerobic fucking sprint every single time we touch hands to roll after class or at the end of class uh, when I'm training? 
because yeah, that's going to happen. And the thing is, um, you know, this is a, a paradigm that now you're starting to see as we get uh, with social media and everything and YouTube, we start to get a glimpse more into the rooms of some of the really high level athletes. Not all, because some teams just, you know, they still kind of train on that, just go f fucking ape shit, you know, uh, training mentality as well, and they have some success. But the really most intelligent high level rooms, you'll notice that there is a very measured pace in the majority of training. Doesn't mean they don't have their times when they sprint, but even the world-class athletes, right, have a very, very modulated pace as they try and optimize their training for skill development. It isn't just about, quote unquote, going hard, right? Trying your all and leaving it all, well, you know, that saying like, leave it all on the mat type of thing. So, especially if you're thinking about regular training, not just training for like a competition, it's gonna be a time and place to really push yourself and, you know, kind of like deal with, deal with adverse situations, fatigue and all that stuff when you're training for a specific goal for competition, but in regular sustained training, uh, you really need to understand that. And also, our, if we are in good shape, our capacity for output can stay pretty high for a long period of time, but it's really important to understand, which a lot of people, as they start to get into 40s, 50s, 60s, don't, is that in most cases, and there's individual um, variability here, but in most cases, right, your ability to recover will go down, even if your ability to actually do the output in the practice will be maybe as high as people who are considerably younger than you, you are going to see that you're gonna to have to modulate if you wanna be able to do those four days a week, five days a week, so on and so forth as you get older, because you're simply not going to be able to recover as well as your younger counterparts in most cases, right? Unless you're, um, you know, taking some extra supplemental help, right? So that being the case, um, being the case, uh, intensity and volume, right? So we have a couple markers here for being able to help out with that, right? One is um, in my whole organization, but I've talked about it here at 40 plus BGJ, we use what we call I method. And there's a couple keys there because some people do this, a lot of people think that they're doing this, but when you actually look at what they're talking about versus what we're talking about, it's not the same, right? So I've had this conversation so many times when I've talked to people either through email in person, and oh yeah, we do that too. We do positional sparring, we do situational sparring. Then you'll find out, right, it's just like 100%. Not ideal. Better than not doing it, because the, the real idea there behind uh, this is adaptive, resistance because if you just go in like kind of the traditional paradigm you go into class you learn some skills often even if they're taught articulately in a sequence a lot of times are they just what the instructor likes doing or are they sort of for the entire room right um, meaning are only a certain amount of people ever going to be able to assimilate these skills into their game that gets very niche. That's much more about the instructor's preferences than it is about teaching to the room. It's already one problem. But then the instructor comes in, teaches some skills, multiple steps. Everybody practices those with, you know, uh, total resistance from their partners and then get water, come back in, roll as hard as you can, right? So what you're essentially doing is training at about zero, like zero resistance, then you're asking everybody to get water, come back to the mat, and then all of a sudden go 100%. So how well does this work if that's your model? Now again, confirmation bias comes into that because it will always produce some high level of skill from the very athletic coordinated people because all they need to do is train and they'll always be good. You'll always have that in every single academy, um, but it's not a testament to the process so much as it is to the individuals. So when we're looking at the process part, right, we wanna have some way to not just have to leapfrog from zero up to 90, 95%, 100%, but to have that be incremental so that we can really be able to facilitate the positive feedback loops. Um, and the way that we do that is through the middle stage. So in the, um, this heuristic called I method, right? So introduction stage, that is simply just the cooperative, right? We're just going for perfect form. We're not trying to fight each other whatsoever. 
just make sure we really understand what it is we're doing and we can do it technically as close to perfect as possible. The next one is isolation. And the final one, integration. Integration is rolling, wrestling. If you were um, boxing, it would be actually like boxing your partner, not just doing drills, but actually now we're boxing. And when it comes to isolation, this is sort of like the, the key bridge between theory, meaning I can do it correctly with no resistance or very, very tiny bit of resistance, and the real application, right, the full integration, this is the bridge. So what we wanna do there is have a relatively low level of realistic resistance, meaning your partner isn't just being a mannequin now, they're actually trying to do the things to prevent you from reaching your goal. Like if the class is on guard passing, okay, is your training partner now actually giving you realistic guard retention, maybe throwing up some offense at you, will let you know if they can sweep you by actually sweeping you, will let you know if they can slap on a submission. But when the timer starts, that training partner is not going to try as hard as they can to do that. In fact, they're gonna start off with a relatively low level of resistance. Based on your technical success, not your absolute success, okay? Technical success, meaning, was I able to do it with explosiveness, with quickness, with being Gumby flexible, with whatever. Was I still able to pass your guard? Um, well, if I did it just on physicality primarily, or I was relying too much on physicality, then that wouldn't really be, be solving the problem, which is why you gotta articulate this to your students. Um, but if I am able to pass your guard when you're giving me maybe about subjectively 25% of your guard play on bottom, then I did it relying primarily on technique and as little as possible on physicality, then your job as a good training partner is we reset immediately, I go to try and pass again, and this time you're gonna try harder. Now you go to 30%. What happens, this becomes a diagnostic tool, right? Feedback. Because let's say when you're giving me what you would consider to be about 50%, I'm still successful. This is a little hard, right? But I'm still successful, 60%. Now I'm really kind of struggling to do it technically. Maybe I felt like I tried to fight a little too much with my grips and um, too much dynamic energy or something. Now that is telling me I'm about to lose it or maybe at 70% I lose it. Now I got to problem solve there and figure out how can I rely more on connection, position, things like that, less on dynamic movement, strength, grips, all that shit, right? And so you can now without having to have an instructor even, you now are self-assessing where you really need to work on it. And at that point, you can't you ask a better question for a senior student, for an instructor to come and help you with the new inputs to say, I feel like I'm missing something. I think I'm, I'm losing it right about here when he was trying this much and, and I get caught up. I think this is the problem, but this is something you don't see coach, right? That maybe I'm seeing, you know, and see how much more advanced of, of a question you now have because of the process. Can you also see, but as an aside, why when people say, you talk about training and frustrations and stuff, and people come back with a sort of reductive, often um, kind of dismissive, dude, just train, just train, bro. Just shut up and train, right? How, again, not untrue, because for sure, putting in the requisite amount of mat time. There's no amount of yapping about this stuff that is going to substitute for actually going to class for years and practicing jujitsu. However, if you say just train, aren't you really making a case that it doesn't matter what this looks like, right? That it's all equally optimal when clearly it's not, right? Like if you're skipping this entirely, how much more difficult life is probably gonna be. If you're just going in and having death matches every time you roll, how much more difficult life is gonna be, how much more time you're gonna be set back with inju injuries, how much more frustration you're gonna feel, how that may in turn um, on an unconscious level lead you to feel like your status is lowered, right over, it kind of blew up your image of what you thought this was going to be, and now your glory days are behind you, and now you quit jujitsu with some sort of post-rationalizations. Well, I got really busy with 
family and work and all that stuff and I just couldn't put on the pajamas anymore or whatever the case may be, right? There's all these things that go on in our minds. So clearly all ways to do this, all systems for approaching skill development in jujitsu or anything else are not created equal. So to say just train is, is correct insofar as you do need to put in the requisite amount of time and work, but how intelligent, how well optimized is that time of work is very relevant, right? So it's not just train, it's just train plus, right? In other words, just train is correct in a certain context, but it's incomplete. Oops, I've got my uh, vacuum robot going down there. So, all right. Um, so one thing is training intensity and volume. And we talked about, okay, first making sure that you have the intermediary step. Now, if your coach or professor, what have you, doesn't do that type of thing in class, there is a workaround I've recommended to probably a thousand people by now, which is get together with somebody you trust who's interested in problem solving in the same way that you are, and you give each other time outside of class. And you say, oh, you know, I don't have a place to do that, or there's no available space on the mat outside of class. Man, I've literally gone to my friend's house back in the day, moved the coffee table over and like propped it next to the couch and got a space of rug to do it. You know, it's like where there's a will, there's a way. Um, but you can get so much productive time out of that with well, problem solving, right? In jujitsu, are you more dedicated to solving problems or are, in other words, are you making it about jujitsu or are you making it about you? Of course, we're human beings, imperfect, right? So we do have egos, so it's like evolutionary. And we do have a relationship to jujitsu. All of us, myself included, right, have felt the pangs and the frustrations and the wanting it to be different than it is at whatever point. But for the most part, can you really just put that on the shelf and just try and make it about the jujitsu? Because the more that you do that, the paradox there is then the less of an issue all your personal judgments and desires will be, right? They sort of sort themselves out over time. Be really dedicated to the process. Um, now, another thing aside from isolation training that I put here is um, advanced rolling. So this is has nothing to do with your skill level. In other words, um, as long as you are maybe a mid-level white belt with enough savvy to know all the positions and the, and the goal for all the positions and essentially what it is that you're doing on the mat, you don't know that unless you've watched a lot of stuff prior to starting training online or whatever. But um, when you first come in, you don't know all these things, right? You're like learning to speak a new language. Now I'm assuming, right, you have grammar and syntax in your game and all that stuff. You, you know how to speak that language, even if you're not particularly proficient at it. But when you come in now, uh, advanced rolling refers to your approach to rolling. And again, you'll see this a lot in some of the high level rooms now that we've got, you know, these YouTube channels and stuff taking, giving a peek in of what we've been doing for years even with just regular students, right? Or, or at least doing our best to consistently try and facilitate that this is what we want you to train like, and then trying to be on it so we can make that part of the culture. It doesn't mean that regular students are gonna be world beaters, but they will get very proficient and have much healthier joints and everything with far less injuries over time if you do it this way. And that is uh, what we call advanced rolling has a few criteria, so number one, and this is probably the most important one, is if you are trying to accomplish a goal in the moment, right, during the process of training, in a live, in live training, not just intro stage, basically after intro stage, everything here is alive, right? It's live training, dynamic variable environment. So the moment you do that, um, when you go in there, if you find that you are fighting any particular thing too hard, right? When I say a thing, is it trying to strip a grip? Is it trying to get past somebody's knee shield? Is it uh, trying too hard to, um, you know, pull down their arm when they're wrapping their arm around your neck or whatever? Anything you're doing too hard, when, you know, the the metal, when the uh, the money isn't on the line or anything like that, when you're just learning, anything you're trying too too hard. You want to see you, you want to basically say 
in the best interests of my jujitsu long term, not right now in this moment, because maybe I could, because I've got a 400 pound deadlift or 500 pound deadlift, I could probably just erupt out of this. But in my training, is that actually going to make me better at jujitsu or is it just gonna get me out of the situation right now? When you encounter something where you have to use too much physical energy, find another way or be willing to lose right then. Because if you're willing to lose right then, you know what happened, like where you got caught, where the insufficiency was. But through the positive feedback loop, now you can go back and try and fix that as long as you don't go by going back to 100% intensity again, right? We need to go back and put a little bit of lower intensity volume into the problem solving. And then, because again, volume and intensity have an inverse relationship, and then we go back into the process again, right? And um, if you do that, that is huge because basically, I'm gonna give you the reframe there, a critical reframe. When you are encountering an obstacle, whether it's an actual physical obstacle, somebody's putting up with a grip or a frame or something like that, or even like kind of a mental block in terms of I keep doing the same thing over and over again in this position in jujitsu expecting a different result, right? That definition of insanity, which isn't actually right, but we know that saying. Let that be your guide rather than your frustration. In other words, I know this way is too much effort. I know that right now I'm trying to essentially walk through a fucking wall so this is showing me if I have to use too much physicality to solve the problem, that I need to go find a door or I need to find an open window, something that I can go through that's gonna be a lot easier than what I'm doing right now. So instead of getting consistently frustrated by it and putting more and more physical energy into something where you're not getting the result, then just simply let that be your guide to show you where the opening may be. Back to positive feedback loop, right? So that's really important and a very useful like reset. It really lets you relieve a lot of the pressure on yourself. The other thing is your breathing. So I'm not getting any particular breathing technique here, even though there's some great stuff out there with like the breathing technique Hicks and made uh, famous and all of that stuff, which can be very beneficial. But I'm just talking just about regular breath control. So for the most part, when I'm rolling, even with uh, some of my main training partners, of course I do have quite a bit of experience, right? But this is not something that's just for me. I have my younger students, lower belt levels um, doing this as well. Really try and make sure that very seldom am I ever <laughs> like really respirating that hard and out of breath. So one of the other criteria for advanced rolling is, are we able to at any point during a roll, and I don't just mean like a five minute roll, but I mean like if we're just going say, no time limit during an open mat until there's a submission. Um, this personally my favorite one, grab one of my training partners and you know, it'd be 20 minutes, sometimes an hour, just one roll, just kind of going, 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 and then finally, you know, let's get some water. Um, but I, I love doing that, right? It's, it's move, moving meditation. Um, it also kind of trains you for that template of no time limit just to submission. But the point there is that um, during that, at any point, could you stop? And sometimes as an instructor of the class, right, the coach, I'll actually stop and just say, stand up and can you have a conversation right now? Now if you're going, <laughs> like you can't have a conversation. So in regular training for the most part, are you always in that much control of your energy and therefore your breathing that you could just stand up and have a, um, have a conversation? And the last one, also really key, last criteria for advanced rolling, is not keeping score. That doesn't mean you're not doing analysis, but it means you're not worrying about the tap. You're not worrying about the positional dominance outside of any objective feel about what it is that you're trying over here, right? So what I mean is you don't wanna be the purple belt that's going back to the locker room or going hanging out with your friends uh, outside of class and being like, oh, you know, today I got the brown belt, today I got the black belt, today I tapped out the instructor, whatever, right? This is a process of skill development. This is not whose dick is bigger, you know, today, who won the role, won the role, right? <laughs> we had a couple of our white belts who like moved up from our basic class where they're just doing like um, basically the sweep through of all the basic um, techniques that we need 
that basically we've selected, identified for them to understand the key positions and give them some things that they can do that are very high percentage to start to understand the game from those positions, whether it's escapes or control to submission, so on and so forth. So that's our beginner program. And they only do like really, really light isolation training, if at all, in that class, it's mostly intro stage. And then very quickly, once they've gone through that, then we start to phase them into live drilling through isolation and, and introduce them to rolling. So we had a couple guys did their first roll and they go up to one of the senior students. I heard it. It's like, oh, I won my first roll today. <laughs> right. And, you know, again, no judgment because that's on that's on us to make sure that that's clear about what it is they should be doing, what what the what the class is. But, you know, basically saying, look, um, winning the match today, like winning your your training and practice with your friends, your training partners and everything. If that's if you're looking at it as a win lose. It's going to be a very long road that's going to get just fraught with frustration over time. So there are times, obviously, when we do want to test ourselves, push ourselves, want to be very honest about that. Um, you know, if you if you are using a modality, which I use a lot, um, personally speaking, when I'm trying to solve new problems, which um, I'm borrowing some terminal, terminology from uh, one of my senior students, um, fifth degree black belt, and he would describe this as, I'll let you in, but I won't let you out. What does that mean? Well, I may shave back my guard retention enough so that I'm not just dropping my legs to the mat and letting you pass and jump on top of me, but I'm really not trying very hard on my guard because I want you to pass my guard because I want to work on something on bottom, like say my side escapes or my submission defense or something like that. And so I give you the window to get where you want to be, or maybe I, oh, I leave the, the mount position open. So the moment you mount though, then I'm trying, technically, right? Not just explosively, as hard as I can, but then I'm trying. And if you catch me at that point, then you catch me and I'm not, I don't need to go back and like tell you so everybody can hear it. Hey guys, like I was just trying to work on my mount bottom. And it's even worse if you weren't, but then you're trying to make it like you were, right? So just fuck all that guys. Like, this is what's important. The toughest thing, by the way, with that isn't that you know what you were doing. It's that somebody else is keeping score. So when it comes to advanced rolling, right, if, if you're not keeping score, that's one level of kind of a, a, a adult development you have to have in jujitsu to this practice. The other thing, though, is it's really dicey is when you're, especially if you're a more advanced belt or somebody at your same belt level, when you can kind of tell they're keeping score and then all of a sudden you want you need to justify yourself man don't just just go in and make it about solving problems doing your best jujitsu so it's not about you john you steve you whatever it's about just the jujitsu okay first and foremost and then whatever significance that you get out of training will will arrive in time so that's always going to be the case and finally, I have just a couple other tips in terms of injury prevention, frustration, mitigation here. Um, the intensity is huge. How you're modulating training, again, are you, are you death gripping? Do you feel like you've just done an, uh, an anaerobic sprint, like you're breathing really hard, you're spent after a training session? Not just tired, like depleted, like, oh man, whew, that, that was... That was good, I did a lot of moving around there, like I could go home and take a nap for 20 minutes or something, that's not a bad thing. Um, I do that as well, especially if I've done like open mat for a couple hours or something, when I, you know, usually Saturdays, I, I have my most like time for myself to have some fun um, for an extended period of time. But if you feel like every single training session you wake up the next day and it's like you sprinted, it's like you lifted as hard as you can in the gym and your body is just aching to the bone, Usually it's about that intensity to volume and how you're approaching your training. And also, are you just doing like death matches? Are you over relying on physicality? But I'll give you a couple other things. So speaking of strength from earlier, with the strength conversation, um, strength training along with not, not so much flexibility per se, but mobility training, making sure that you're still mobile in all your joints, like have good posture and everything. Strength training is one of the very best things you can do. Um, my caveat there going back to intensity relative to volume is that most people, and when I say most, I mean almost all, even people who have 
really great results with their supplemental training regimens that they do outside of jujitsu are doing unnecessary levels of volume and load. And I'm not gonna get into that now. Let's just say that when it comes to, you guys have heard me talk about first principles jujitsu and distilling things down to their rudiments and making sure that they are, you know, uh, really sound from first principles. And I posted a video here with Elon Musk talking about first principles versus reasoning by analogy and uh, fallacious reasoning and things like that. How hard that is to do? Well, I've, I've gone down the rabbit hole of first principles of strength training as well as, as a form of supplemental exercise to really help your joints hold together and be optimal. And when you're trying to measure that against, I'd like to train three, four, five times a week maybe, and I'm now getting up into, you know, older ages and jujitsu years. Well, man, some people may still be able to thrive with the higher volume approaches to doing strength training. A lot of times those are gonna replicate, um, uh, which I was doing for a long time too. You know, they'll kind of take the form of a powerlifting regimen, but um, it's not necessarily the best way to do it in terms of optimal. And it's, it's for sure unnecessary to get the desired result. So what I would submit to you is that strength training is great, not for the purpose of using your strength and training because we want to shelf that as much as possible again just because you can doesn't mean you should totally different in a self-defense situation totally different in a competition you you bring to the table as an athlete everything that you have to be able to win right in competition you're trying to win in training we're trying to optimize our technique right as little reliance on physicality as possible so we know already from uh, intensity and volume, right? Well, well, sort of a, a parallel to that is there's also an inverse relationship between the amount of physicality you're relying on and your technical expertise. So when people say, well, it's okay to use as much strength as you want as long as you're also being technical, just understand there's an inverse relationship there, right? You can't optimize for both equally. So by default, the more strength you're using, the less technique you're using. It simply is. So we want to minimize that. Nobody can use no strength, right? It's very hard to use 5% strength, sometimes even 10% strength, right? So um, that, is, that is true, but we always wanna be using the, the, the bare minimum, like an 80-20 rule there is a good one to go by. But um, so strength, mobility, very important. Just make sure that you're remembering that the jujitsu is supposed to take the primacy, right? To be able to hold together and be healthy in your life and to continue practicing jujitsu, not to make the strength training, the thing, right? It's there to supplement you so that you can perform the thing that you love to do. And the other thing, because uh, I'm not really gonna get into diet, obviously that's important, making sure you get enough protein and all that stuff, but there's so many variables there with different people with their, everything from their microbiome to certain considerations that they may have ideologically about eating, whatever, like I'm kind of leaving that conversation for you and, um, somebody like qualified to assess you on an individual level. But one thing I will say that is also a universal aside from strength training is recovery. And instead of thinking so much about, you know, all the different supplements and joint stuff and all that stuff, think more. The number one recovery tool bar none is sleep. I did a really extensive deep dive training on sleep that actually like it would surprise most people. And the most interesting thing is when it came to performance, right? Over and above all the other factors, including nutrition and actually what you do in the gym or whatever when you're, when you're exercising, the number one health focus there was optimizing for sleep. I would not consider myself to have mastered that even though I did this extensive training. I haven't done everything around it because it's, it's quite an intensive regimen. But what I would um, highly suggest for people I finally broke down and got one of these, um, I think it was uh, about a year and a half ago. This is an Aura Ring, O-U-R-A, and this actually gives you some empirical data on your sleep quality and your what's called your readiness score. And I found it to be even more um, revealing than I would have expected insofar as 
it's a bit counterintuitive some days where you feel like maybe you're pretty tired, but your readiness score is actually pretty good. And inversely, some days you, fe you feel good when you first wake up and you're like, oh, I, I must have a high readiness score. And you see it's not as high as you thought it would have. And maybe something was going on in your sleep because you actually didn't sleep um, with the same level of quality that you thought. And then sure enough, it'll hit you later in the day. So um, subjective feeling isn't necessarily aligned to the data that you actually have when you're wearing one of these while you sleep. And um, that was really useful for me to kind of gauge my intensity and my approach to um, what I'm going to do today, maybe take an extra day off from doing any supplemental exercise, things like that, really helped with my recovery. And um, getting run down, getting overtrained, getting predisposed to injuries and tweaks and things like that. So that, that was really big. The other thing, uh, personal takeaway is that I thought I was sleeping way more than I actually was. You know, I'm thinking, yeah, by the time I fell asleep and kind of wound down everything in bed, you know, I, I think I slept probably close to eight hours and it would be like six hours and 40 minutes, <laughs> like consistently, usually like an hour or more less than I thought I was actually sleeping. So that really um, gave me, again, a positive feedback loop for looking at my habits around sleep and trying to optimize that. And I noticed a major difference. And um, then finally, I put like supplementation and things way below that. A lot, a lot of people um, for sure are D deficient and the aching to the bone feeling like when you get out of bed every morning is a classic symptom of D deficiency. So uh, especially like I live in Massachusetts, which is um, Northern States, right? So we have a lot of indoors with long sleeves and stuff for half the year. And, um, you know, obviously not soaking up the rays during that habit. So I need to supplement with my D. It made an instant, instant difference. And then relative to every, everything we're talking about, I put any like additional supplementation on, you know, CBD and curcumin or whatever you're doing, right? Turmeric, turmeric or turmeric, um, all that type of stuff like lower than that, uh, fish oils and stuff, important, but these are the big moving parts. So anyway, I'm gonna cap it there because I've already been going for close to an hour, uh, but I really hope these tips help you guys. Again, I know some people just wanna go like, shut up and just train or whatever. They don't, I'm not gonna listen to you yap for 57, 58 minutes. Totally cool, man. But um, I've gotten so much good feedback on these longer form videos for people that do decide they're going to play them. By the way, you can always put this on, um, on a, you know, download a speed controller or whatever. And um, you can put this on a higher speed setting, play it in the car, just in the background, whatever. But I hope that these things, um, and then come back and watch the video later when you're not driving. <laughs> but I hope these things do help. Um, certainly help me with my approach to jujitsu. And I've gotten a lot of feedback from people over the years. It's tremendously helped them as well. So uh, if you have any further questions, let me know. I'll try and answer it. Take care.